All right, we are recording. Welcome, everybody. We're really happy to see all of you tuned in for this exciting demo by Oren Hetzronio from Israel. I probably totally butchered pronouncing your name, so forgive me, Oren, if I did. Um, he has graciously agreed to do a demo for us of how he goes about carving uh, the spoon that he has put up for us for Ruach Spoon Challenge 16. The template is available up on riseupandcarve.com on our challenge page. Um, and he is doing these wonderful uh, spoons uh, with uh, some really nice facet work on the handle and uh, some really cool finials that he's given us some suggested uh, templates for. Uh, but you're, of course, as always with these challenges, free to kind of take it in whatever direction you want to take it. Um, but anyway, yes, so welcome, Owen. And I'm going to uh, turn over the floor to you and let you take it away. All right. Well, hi, hi everyone. Um, I think I know almost everyone here, or either I've carved with uh, personally, uh, like face to face or, uh, or here on Rise Up. Um, I uh, originally was thinking of uh, just demonstrating the fact and uh, the finial, but I figure it could can't hurt to go over um, the steps of making a spoon. So I'm just going to make the spoon um, fast, kind of uh, the way I usually make a spoon. And I'll talk along uh, on how I do it. Uh, most of probably do the same steps that I do or uh, some variation of them. Um, I'm going to be making uh, the spoon today out of avocado that fell uh, branch two days ago in a windy uh, storm we had. Um, I like to use uh, cars for sleeping because it's uh, a nice, cheap, uh, relatively, uh, uh, I don't know, not sharp angle, I guess. So it's great for splitting, and I don't uh, mind if it's, it's outside next to my uh, next to my block. I'm doing uh, my axing sitting down. I usually do my axing uh, at least in, maybe not, not my rough axing, but the delicate axing I do sitting down. That's why I prefer the smaller axes. I'm using uh, uh, maybe a kind of axe right now. I start by making, I kind of know roughly the ratio that I like. Uh, Owen, I think I accidentally muted you. Can you unmute yourself? Have I Sorry been about that. We just missed whatever the last like 20 seconds or so of what you were saying was. <laughs> That's all right. So uh, what I was saying is that I like to do my crank before I draw my uh, template on. Um, I usually use templates, templates, um, not just for the spoon challenges. It uh, helps me uh, keep going back to my original design. And uh, so throughout, I'm not worried about erasing my, my lines. I can always just put my template back on and go over it again. So I made my crank. I make sure I have enough room up here for extra snail. There we go. That's looking good. There's only one way to sharpen a pencil. I like to put my crank um, uh, at about the two thirds mark or depending which direction you're looking at it. So roughly here, this might be confusing with the 
a template. I marked here the width for the measurements. This mark doesn't signify where the crank should be. In most templates, the line is where the crank should be. And that's not what I did here. So um, this marking is the crank. The crank should be right here. Um, and this, if I'm already getting to that, this line right here is not an extra facet. This is supposed to be a five facet spoon, not a six facet spoon. All right, so I put it down. I, I put the crank where I want it to be, which is roughly here. A crank could always be down here, meaning it could be a spoon that goes like this, and it could be a spoon that goes like this. In this case, this is where I'm putting it. Next is to decide on a, on a finial. Now, if I'm putting it right here, it's not a big deal. If it's climbing on one of the sides, it doesn't bother me too much. If I'm planning on putting the snail right up here, I have to rethink the way I'm doing it because I would be putting it like that and then I would have to make a stop cut stop cut and cut out uh, the handle this way but uh, in this case I'm going to do the snail uh, floating on top so he doesn't really upset the flow of uh, of the spoon um, I'll do some stop cuts just because um, it's safer during a demo so I won't have to start from from scratch in case I miss I never miss unless I'm trying to show somebody how to do it. Can you see all right? Is uh, the direction of the camera okay and all that? Yes, it's working well, I think. Yeah, it's nice to see you in high def and smooth video. A new iPhone. If you were to, if you were going to put the snail on the on the on the handle the other way, would your blank have to be thicker? Yes, um, this blank might be thick enough to squeeze a, a snail, but I wouldn't be able to get as big of a crank, or I would be able to. Yeah, it would be just a bit lower down. So I would be doing it either a bigger saddle. So I would put it like that, lower down, and then the snail would sit somewhere about here. Have you always axed sitting down or is that something you worked into? Um, I just, where, wherever I happen to be a closer block. So um, I've got blocks spread out. I sometimes act standing up. Um, if it's something bigger, usually I'll do it uh, standing up. Um, I find that the detail work, the less muscle you use, the, the more precise you can or more force you can put in a very specific spot. So if I'm not having to, you know, worry about uh, chewing gum and walking, 
So I'm not, don't have to stand and I don't have to. Anyhow, I, I feel it's more, uh, I can get more precise work when I'm sitting down. It looks like you're working on a pointy variation of your spoon. That'll be nice for the demo. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of if the number nine and the number 16 would have an illegitimate baby. Um, for beginning spoon carvers, I find that the thing that's hardest to grasp is the importance. Uh, I'm sure everybody here that's been carving for a while knows this, but it's important to keep repeating the importance of working 90 degrees to this face. So I started out by giving a little bit of the profile view or the side view. And then I'm trying to be as precise as I possibly can in the top view. So even though I do still have the temp, I can always put it back on. I would like to be as close as I can to my original design. If I start moving off and curving down and not working precisely as if this was cut on a bandsaw, um, then I will slowly lose um, the ability to get exactly what I want, I kind of lose the um, the original the original drawing. It looks like you've already cut in the keel a little bit on the bottom of the spoon. Is that I, have, I, I do that. You, yes, I do that with the axe in the as one of the first uh, steps. I just knock it, knock it here and here, and it falls right, off. I saw there's like a little notch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Where you get tied in on the neck on this, so like on the template, right? You've got the the, the little uh, like um, I don't little know, little, yeah, little notches at the at the at the bowl to neck transition and at the handle into the neck. Um, do you wait until later to to do that? Yeah, I, I add those in uh, really towards the end, and I kind of just, especially if they're going to be relatively small, um, I just bring down this part of the neck a tiny bit anyway usually i have to go back and forth a little bit to uh, make it symmetric uh so i i use that as the time to do it then i'll just bring it down a little bit here a little bit here and mm -hmm. um play around with it i feel that if if i try to put all these details in too early i'll uh, try to stick to them and then um it might mess up the rest of the flow of the spoon so i'm trying to do everything kind of together every every part of it at the same relative level okay um, so the the next step uh i usually do is well i'll go into a little bit more detail right here around uh around the snail head here i move to a short sloid 
Um, so you could use just your regular um, Mora for this, but I feel it's a bit safer if I've got a shorter blade, less chance of, uh, of, of an injury since I'm putting kind of a, bit, a lot of pressure in uh, uh, small areas and they're close to my hand. So you could wrap up a Mora up to here, but I'm giving you an excuse to buy another knife. So, right, so something like a Mora 120 or, or even smaller. Even smaller, uh, Ben Offord has a really nice short, uh, short sloids like this. I think uh, that's what Lydia is using as her color rosing knife. Yeah. And they are and a real... small pick pick knife. I think she was the one she uses. Yeah, they're really sweet. See, this one is about, I would say, an inch long. This yep. is made by uh, a local blacksmith, but um, you could you could really use anything for this. It doesn't have to be too flat of a grind. Mine is relatively convex because I use it also for lettering and things like that. Places that you want to have a tight curve, you're going to want a bit more of a convex blade so you get less chatter. Okay. So now I pretty much cut out uh, the spoon to the, to the template. But I'm still not 100% at my side view because I kind of did it rough with, with the axe. Okay. So um, to make, to make uh, the, the swoop here flow better, I take out some, some material. I, I like to do the, my rough stuff with, uh, with the Tuca can. Uh, the reason I did that is so I could pull all this down in one go. Now here, I try to lift my spoon and make sure it's straight. I look at it st straight on from this view. I look at it from this view a couple of times. This is, while I still have a lot of mass here, I can play around and fix, and, uh, fix it if it's warping to one of the directions. Okay, I am pretty happy with the profile. Um, at this step, because I want the um, snail kind of tucked in, I I'm uh, not going to do facets, snails, and speak about each one separately at this point because I don't do them separately. I kind of do it all um, throughout the spoon. So I'm just showing this at, as, I, as I do it, and I'll go back with the other blanks I made and just repeat what I did here um, so you could uh, get it a little bit better if uh, you missed something. <laughs> This looks like it's a little bit thick for what I want back here. So I'll take off a bit of material. Is still <laughs> that was a nun's phone. It's all right. All right. Ooh. So now just to mark this area. You could do it with a short knife. And like you would 
classic chip carving and peel it out. Or you could do it quickly with a little V gouge. These are very handy for um, relief carving. Okay, I just marked it so I can pull from here down. Um, there. At this point, I'm ready to do the start working on the facets. Usually, I will finish uh, pretty much the facets and uh, and then start kind of roughing out or getting closer and closer to a finished um, snail at, at uh, this point. Or I'll take a little bit. I'm, I'm going to ignore the bowl on this spoon right now. I would be moving closer unless you think we have the time to talk about um, the steps I do for the bowl, um, but that's I'm in I'm in no rush. I mean, uh, we've yeah we've we've recorded things up to two hours long, so do do whatever you feel. All right, I mark this area. I usually eyeball it. I just did that for um, usually when I'm explaining, I do it. I just grab this and do a little carpenter's mark right along this, um, maybe at uh, the two millimeter distance. all the flies in the winter here we get rain and then we get really hot days like today and then we have a lot of flies I assume the quality of the picture is so good you can see a lot of flies yeah I've been able to see flies on your chopping block and on your arm and stuff it seems impressive nice. to me that you don't swat them away yeah um it's, uh, it's, I, I learned my lesson that time that I swatted one away and sliced my forehead with the Mora knife. Um, and since then I've been really Zen patient about the flies. And I'm not gonna win this battle. I mean, there is, there's so many flies around me right now. There's at some point you just have to say that's it and, and give up. They, they win. Looks like a pretty big Sloyd knife. Just curious, which, which Sloyd is that? Uh, this is the Nick, Nick Westerman uh, Sloyd. Okay. It's just a bit bigger than the than the Mora. Yep. Okay. In this specific uh, spoon, the keel I'm doing is the kill I usually do on my spoons. I'll grab one of the finished ones. So it's just a clean uh, transition. Um, so what I usually do is one facet that runs around the side, which is, uh, I guess, the side view facet, or this, which will be this line. It'll be a continuous line that runs around the, the entire spoon. Um, 
and then this top corner, I'm going to do a facet that runs around here. You see it okay? It runs around here. And then this will be the side facet. Yeah. And then the top one, which is, which is, uh, which is flat classic. Um, and the back, I could either do the same facets back here and then kind of merge them in. You could do one facet that runs and keep the same facets in the back if you'd like and just do. Completely flat. I like it that it's the same facets that run throughout the whole spoon and what they do is just change in with So this is a bit like uh, in the Adam Walker's uh, video about uh, unset outdoors that he does with the straight facet that runs all the way through and then they run around. Um, okay, so I'm okay with the, the size and the direction. Now I'm gonna give it a bit more swoop here in the back and in the front. Here I'll have to move to this way just to swoop it in. Yeah, you're still off camera. There you go. Okay. Okay, what's important in this stage is here, you're gonna want the, um, obviously the keel to be thick because it's thin here. From here, I try to keep it con pretty much at a consistent width. So it follows this curve. Okay, and just clean up the sides to make sure that they're straight and I'm happy with them. Um, at this point, I'm going to give, take this down a little bit so um, it doesn't interfere in my facets as well. Like, like I did earlier, just a, a, a bit more. I'm going to clean up this area so I can take the body a step, a step down. I don't really need to clean it up as much as I am doing right now. I'm just doing that because I know I'm being watched. Otherwise, I would just leave it messy. I wouldn't worry about any tear out. I would leave it fuzzy and, uh, and, and messy and take care of it later. Um, and in general, when I'm uh, doing something from, let's say, a, a sketch that I'm doing and moving it to 3D, um, Probably the best way for me to do it is do in addition to an isometric view, which is like a side view, uh, you know, like a hero shot to make it look cool. I try to do a uh, top view, well, a top view and a side view. So I can kind of figure out how it's going to work. And then when I'm building it, I'm trying or 
turning it into 3D, I would be um, working in those steps as well. Finishing this view and finishing this view. Um, one uh, nice way to do this, which I, um, is really helpful if you have a concept and you're not really sure how to sketch it out properly and uh, having trouble figuring out the three dimensions of it. Um, sometimes we have an idea and then when we bring it out and start carving it, we forget about certain things because in our mind, everything is uh, flawless. But then when we bring it down to something physical, we start having you know problems with, with reality. So a um, uh, really neat trick for it is using uh, uh, Play-Doh. So this is my uh, sketch for the octopus spoon I was working on. I learned this trick from uh, a great carver, uh, Fireside Sloyd. Well, I, I, actually, this, this, is, this is done all the time. Whoever does fig, figure carving, um, it's a very common practice. But I was working on uh, the, <laughs> the George uh, um, Octopus Challenge. So I first did it uh, like this on a mock-up spoon. And then I'll take this and sketch it out and go back to it and kind of learn the three dimensions of it. Um, you don't have to do that with all, all spoons. I brought out a couple of uh, examples of three dimensional carvings that I do. If a knife falls, the smartest thing to do is to try to catch it because your hand will heal, but the knife does not. <laughs> I want to know if everyone winced when they saw that knife roll off the block. Did everyone? <laughs> yep. Now my my floor is uh, is wood, but there is a steel leg coming off of one of the tables here. So uh, for this, for instance, I didn't have to do much. Uh, I did a lot of sketching, but I for a figure like this, I wouldn't. Uh, it's not as complex as some of the others, so I wouldn't uh, sculpt it. Um, ahead of time. Um, but in general, when I'm thinking of something that's uh, uh, a three-dimensional object like this, it's, I do need to think about, remember that this is wood and wood has direction and grain and it's gonna have areas that are very weak. For instance, the horns here are, are you know, short grain like that right here. So if I push too hard on this area, I could, uh, theoretically break these pretty easily or if I squeeze them together. So you need to be aware aware of these kinds of things when, when you're carving. Um, this is my second attempt at, uh, at these because the first one was not attached up here in this, in this little area and it broke off when I uh, gave it a bad look. So <laughs> be uh, consider these kinds of things when you're carving uh, relief carving because that's the kind of things that could be very very disappointing after hours and hours of um, of work um, so I, I I gave everyone a couple of different um, uh, options just suggestions for uh, for these I did the the chicken which I've already started I think I'll do that one as well as uh, an example soon. Um, but I'm really excited to see different things that people are um, going to be coming up with uh, in the next uh, two weeks. Okay, now I'm going to be moving to the to the side view. A snail shell usually kind of goes up like that and then comes back down. So I'm going to release some material right there. It's, it's round, it's not square or rectangle, so I will be adding facets. But in, in general, what, one of the things that I like most about the snails on the on the spoons is they are a realistic size, like the fly that just landed on it. <laughs> uh, they they could it could really be you know it's it, it could 
you could easily see a snail climbing on a spoon. And I think that adds a lot, a lot to it. The, the so do you shape it just as a general sort of like rounded over form? And like at what point then will you go back to cut in the spiral? Um, I'm, I do it uh, one, like I do all the steps slowly. So I'm kind of bringing it closer down to the rough size. So okay. I guess I'm roughing it until I get to the final shape. Okay, it's starting to to look a bit more like a like a snail shell. Um, uh, another point uh, with which uh, I think people appreciate in, in my specific relief carvings is I kind of try to make uh, a different feel of material between the spoon and whatever is climbing on it. Um, or perched on, the, I, I try to remember the spoon is something physical and hard and the organic uh, creature that's climbing on it is softer and kind of morphs around it. So the area between, that they uh, kind of touch each other is very important to see that there's no give in the, in the spoon and all the give in uh, whatever it is uh, climbing on it and see it here. Um, this is another example of something small that could easily be perched on top. This is the frog and you see how the frog is kind of grasping and, and sitting and grabbing on it and the spoon itself kind of morphs uh, freely and stays rigid around it as if it's cast. Okay, at, at this stage, I think I would move to, uh, to starting the facets. I could just take my time on, on, on these stages and um, a spoon that I could probably do within 45 minutes to an hour, I can sometimes sit on it for six hours easily, just you know, going over every little detail not, um, I'm not in a race. I don't uh, do this necessarily for a living. I'm not trying to, to, to make as many spoons as possible unless I'm in a competition with, uh, with somebody uh, for speed. But uh, um, that, that's not exactly, that's not why I'm, I'm doing it. It's not for the, so I, 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 I can take my time and sit on it for a long time, but we don't have that much time now. So I'm not gonna be doing that. Um, there's a few different ways you could do, do your facets. I, um, I usually just eyeball them, but um, I'm gonna go over what I'm looking for when I'm eyeballing. So I take the side view and kind of split it into, into three because this is gonna be my final uh, facets. So it's gonna go down to here, right? And the bottom one, as well if I'm doing uh, the facets also in the back. This is gonna go, and this is gonna go, and this is gonna stay. Okay. Here it's a little harder to do because I'm do, trying to mark the middle facet, the final middle facet that'll be running through here. And then the next facet, I'm gonna put somewhere, here is it. No, it needs to be closer to here, there. You see, I usually don't draw these 
these out. Okay, so I'm gonna cut this down all the way from here. See the facet runs. I don't know if you can in a good spot. Yeah. Runs along from down here all the way to here. I'll do the same. Just hold it up to my chest a minute. Right. So you've got the two lines there to give you the reference points to, to keep your blade yeah. aligned with. Yeah. I don't do it. I don't draw them usually. I'm just doing that to, uh, to explain my thought oh, okay. process. So yep. I, I, I do it uh, blindly. I just, um, I'm doing it here. I'll do it again on the next spoon. One. You see it okay? Yep. Okay. And then the next one, I'm taking this high point and I'm gonna break that into another, the next facet. So. When I divided the lines, I made this line a little bit wider than I want the final line. See, it kind of runs a little bit wider. If this is going to be the, can you see okay? Yeah. If this is going to be my final uh, chamfer or facet. I'm doing it further off because this one I'm going to be splitting into two again. Okay, so this one I'm just gonna grab here. Oh, there you go, that's better. So is it roughly half the width of the next um, facet above that you, you're going over about half the width? Well, the, not, not half because the angle is gonna be, this was lower, lower down. This one's gonna be a little bit higher and a little bit higher. So it, I'm gonna get a little bit less I'll just do part of it. So you see, it's not taking so much off of that side. It's taking a bit more off of this side. And then I'm trying to reach the middle line. Now this line gets a little bit wavy and kind of, it's not the perfect final cut. I go over it in the next step. So here the same. And then the final one, just go on top like that. And then you got five facets. And if I want to do six facets, I'll have to think about that. I'm not sure how to do six facets yet. I've never tried it. The same thing in the back. Um, the back is a little bit more complex for me because I have this area that I want to pull in. So the back I do in two steps. But it's the same exact idea. And then I kind of get the rest of my lines um, to match up to them. Now, I don't necessarily do one fine, one go and that's it. I will be meeting it up here and kind of fixing it up so the corners match up perfectly. Well, as perfect as I can get them. I do like it a little bit rough. That's, that's the idea. And then the next stage I would be doing is hollowing out the bowl. I move on to my uh, faucet, I think is the way to pronounce it. Yeah. 
we had this conversation if it's if it's named after a faucet of a, like a tap. I think the two cameras is working really well, Oren. It's nice to have the detailed view, especially when you were doing the snail shell. Thanks for reminding me. I'll go back to the snail shell. Good. I'm glad it works worked out well like this with the camera. And nobody's yeah. called me so far, so that works out as well. Okay, I try to do this as well in facets. So I'm kind of rounding it off slowly, just like you would be doing a ball finial. So you just break every time uh, the high points and run along them. Mostly it's raising some material and then putting some pressure to release it. Um, the important part is just making sure you hit it perfectly so you don't start getting um, these dirty areas here where you have some tear out or you got some um, not matching knife marks. Now it's easy to say, but that's that's the challenge is just to, to practice. Mm. You, you, you get these uh, perfectly. Um, another part in uh, making these uh, look and feel correct, sometimes it's, I don't know how to, how to explain it. It's, it's, it's a, just something in the feel of, of how you, you make the animal itself. So to try to capture something in it, if it's some kind of motion, um, maybe in the snail here, for instance, you see how his neck is a little bit uh, longer and it feels like he's about to pull the shell back towards him. You know how they move forward, stretch, and then this kind of moves. So this kind of tension in the movement gives it this cute feel that makes it more, uh, more appealing. Um, in the chicken to make her as chubby as possible, kind of sitting and hanging over it like a, mm. like a, you know, a, a, a chubby Rhode Island red that has kind of these sits it's heavy so having this little kind of fat area or these fluffy feathers hanging over the side will give it a lot of appeal okay now i usually sketch this out just to see the ratio of where where i want the spiral to be So you're cutting those lines in just using your regular small sloid? You could do it with a regular small sloid. The easiest way to do it is with a small V gouge. Yeah. A U, a U gouge. Oh, a U gouge. Okay. Yeah. Make sure to sharpen these because it, uh, it's significantly a cleaner cut and it's very hard to clean up inside in the U-gouge if you don't yeah. have it uh, sh sharp. So I guess true with all our tools. Some tools you can kind of get away with more than others. 
I feel that the these little gouges are very important to keep them super sharp. And they're very painful if you cut yourself, just yep. out of experience that um, when you're working with them, remember that they could slip easily and they kind of lodge themselves right here in this soft mm -hmm. little, like a little uh, sheath for your gouges, this soft area. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who was it? Uh, Corn Cornwall uh, Woodcrafter had a nasty injury posted yeah. uh, yesterday, the day before. Cornish, yeah. Yeah, it, it, he didn't have any any damage inside that was really bad, so he's going to be fine soon. Yeah. But looked really bad. We were on, on Zoom when it happened, uh, when he just posted it, we all pulled out our phones and looked at it together. Should have recorded that reaction from everybody. Wow. Yeah, it's definitely one of those, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can I can definitely relate because my, my injury um, uh, was doing the same thing that uh, he did. I was doing uh, a little snail finial and uh, I was raising some grain and then I put just too much pressure pushing down to cut that grain. The knife went just right through it and sliced uh, this uh, area open. And just remember, we're dealing with very sharp tools and a small slip could be, even a small cut could be very, very dangerous at the right place. So. Yeah, I think it's it's trickier too because when you're doing these little finials, it's like like when you're carving like a spoon, you've we've we've sort of gotten to a point where we understand our grasps and our grips and how we can do them relatively safely so that we know that we don't have a body part in the way if it should go through or 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 slip through the cut. But when you're playing around with these little finials and you're moving around in lots of different little directions, I think we're probably less cognizant of you know, where, where that is going to go if it slips because yeah, they're yeah. less standard grips or grasps. That's very true. We are working very close. We're doing uh, different directions and we're working very close to our fingers. Yeah. I find that most of the times I have been getting cut as has been in, in these kinds of situations. Um, most people that do figure uh, carving uh, do wear gloves in our, in our, uh, in spoon carving, it's not very common, but uh, figure carving, because they're working with things so close to them like this in different directions, it's very common to wear gloves. And uh, if uh, you're doing something that you don't feel 100% comfortable with, I would definitely recommend putting on a pair of gloves just for, just for that. Uh, yep, I would agree. So just don't tell anybody because... Well, it's funny because between the two worlds, because I've, I've, I've like played, I started with figure carving before I got into spoon carving and there it was a golden, you just always wear a glove like with like, you know, the wood carving illustrated, you know, crowd, if you will, it's very much a standard. And so I get, I get flack from both sides. <laughs> I get flack from the one side for not wearing a glove and I get flack from the other side for wearing a glove. <laughs> I, I can understand. Yeah, but I, I would recommend it. It's it's not it's not worth it if you're not feeling comfortable or you're doing something that you think might be a little dangerous. Just yep, I put, agree. put on a pair of gloves, finish. Or even so just the can, one, even if it's just the holding hand, you know, yeah. at least because that's the one that's typically more prone to a ser more serious cut as opposed to the, the hand that's holding the knife. Um, but yeah. So I found I don't like wearing a glove on the knife holding hand just because I don't feel like I get as sure a grip and control. Um, but definitely on the, the work holding hand, there's times when it, it's called for. As I told a few times in the jewelry business, you have these little finger thumb thighs thingies. Mm. Really, so they are really popular and I wear, that, wear, wear them all the time when I'm carving. Okay, now 
you can see that the, the snail is broken down to facets as well, just because I, I like that sort of look. It doesn't have to be, it could be completely smoothed out. I could take these facets and break them down into lots more facets in the end, a curved surface. Unless we're using a curved knife, it's gonna be a bunch of very small facets close together. But I kind of like leaving a bit of facets. I think it gives a bit of character. Now, just as I said before about this being stiff and this being soft and organic, um, we need to remember what we're carving as well and the shell is hard. So I tried to give the body a little bit of you know, flexing around or forming around the shells to make it look like it's stretching down properly from it. Just needs to rem remember these kinds of things if we want something to give, have a little bit of a, a realistic feel. It doesn't have to be carved as if it's realistic, but the moment you have something that we can relate to and we say, oh, that looks kind of real, then it does that little bit of magic. Um, I usually use the U gouge for the eyes just because it gives a nice clean finish. Um, I don't push it straight in. I kind of wiggle it a little bit and it does this little sawing motion. Now, if I'm doing it straight from here, I'm gonna need to re release it. So I'm gonna poke it in from this side and cut the grain. Are you able to get that just a little closer to the camera? I'm having a hard time seeing it. There, I'm not looking where. Is it focusing? Yeah, well, it's not. That's pretty good, right? Right about there. Okay, so um, what I did is I took gotcha. the out from the top and pushed it in to do this this yep. little U here. Sometimes the size um, is. Uh, according to the tools we have. A lot of things that we do are, are uh, direct, uh, directly influenced our designs by the tools we have to manufacture them. So yeah. in this case, the width and the size of the snail head works well with this specific U gouge. Otherwise I would have taken one step smaller, or one step bigger, but this specific size works well and gives me a nice uh, size little, um, mark for where the eyes would be. Gotcha. Um, so the next step for me would be just to slowly finish it, finish it off. I get as to a, a consistent distance around here, around, around the rim. Um, I think maybe I'll move on to the other one, to the chicken, just to show how I do it and maybe do another snail um, because it's probably more interesting than finishing off a bowl. Um, so the, the, the chicken uh, as well, I, um, I, I do kind of in a, a facet manner. So I kind of make it, uh, relatively uh, rough and a little bit cubistic, I guess. So if, before I actually move on to rounding it off, if, if at all. So I started off with a block on top, just like we, we all would with when we're leaving material to, to carve with. Um, then I look at the uh, front view, cut it out, move to the side view, in the side view, I kind of clear this area to get it closer. So I kind of do step by step this side and then a little bit back to this side, a little bit back to this side. And then I add the rest of the dimensions slowly al along with, with the carving. So this chicken head could be slimmer. So I'm gonna re remove a bit, a bit more material. They said what makes a cute chicken is a fat chicken. So I'm going to leave this area as wide as I can.
was oxidized already from last night when I carved it. So I'm going to have to remove everything. And then at the end, I will put it in some baking soda to get oxidizing back. Yeah, I can't, I'm not going to leave this completely round. I'm kind of making it swoop down and then fall over this way. That's mm. kind of, um, I, I would imagine that something heavy sitting on the side of something thin like that, it would just stretch out and the weight would be pulling it down and kind of sagging. And I think that's, these little details are important to make it feel like it's a, a chicken that's perching on something. It's, it's true for anything you're you're making if you'd have a little elephant sitting on top you'd have the same effect so a lot of little releasing materials and then move down Just by way of reminder, if anybody has any questions uh, as we're going along here, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask your question. And then just remember to remute yourself after you've spoken up. How many snails do you think you've carved, Oren? That is a very good question. Today? <laughs> Um, whew, I'm, I don't know. I really don't know. I'm guessing, uh, I'm guessing in the, in the hundreds. I don't know. I've been doing them, uh, for not that long like this, uh, on all my spoons for maybe two years. What prompted you to carve snails? Uh, that's a good question too. Um, I've always had a very strange fondness for snails. Um, I was the snail guy in high school already. I was collecting snails and categorizing them and uh, I had uh, giant African land snails as pets and uh, I've just always really been intrigued by snails. I'm not sh really sure why. If you you can see, but over, can you, can you see it here? Yeah, Cl climbing on on the fireplace right here. Oh uh, yeah, that's a snail, and there's another snail, and along the chimney there's a snail climbing. This was quite a few years ago. They're all over all over the farm. There's little snails decorating things. Very very heat tolerant snails. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How common, how common are snails in Israel? Are they just around? Uh, yeah, they're very common. You can see sometimes poles that are just, you can't see the pole. It's all just covered in little tiny snails climbing all over them. Wow. Yeah, they're, they're pretty common in this area, especially. At least, I don't know, maybe in some areas more. But. I forget, where, where in Israel are you? I'm smack in the middle, so I'm just 20 minutes north of Tel Aviv. I'm about five minutes drive uh, east of the Mediterranean. Can I ask who made your tweaker cam and the faucet? Yes, it was Nick Westerman. Ah, I'm on the waiting list. <laughs> oh, you have time. Oh, no. yeah. Raise your hand who's not on the Nick Westerman <laughs> waiting list. I was going to say, along with like probably four fifths of the spoon carving world, who's also on the waiting list.
okay, I could fuss around with these things forever, but in general, this fantastic. Little, um, oh, this area I didn't I didn't clean up. That's very important. Make sure you it's the connection between the spoon. I want to make sure that it, it doesn't look like the spoon has been changed in any way because it's got something climbing on it. That's very important to me to make sure that the little swoop I would do here at the end would be there anyway. And uh, the uh, first facets I did like before, and then um, I pull these down next to, I just get as close as I possibly can. If I can't really get up there, a handy tool for this and another knife that needs to be bought. Um, this is the uh, Turning Sloyd by uh, Nick Westerman. Mm. Uh, Unavailable through Hewn and Hone and a lot a lot easier to, to get a hold of. What's nice with this blade is just it's very, very uh, narrow. You could do this with a small chip carving knife. Um, I do it sometimes with this. This is uh, Magnus's uh, chip carving, but um, Nick also has a very nice blade, which I just ordered and I'm waiting for it to arrive. I think it's called a clip point. Uh, and it has also a very thin, narrow area right there, which you can get in very tight places. You sometimes need to when you're doing this kind of carving. So the advantage is I can start really way up on top and then pull down the facet. I kind of messed up my other facet by doing that. So there, I can fix it. And then I can run down here. Look at that. And I've got five facets running down without the chicken barely uh, bothering me. It's okay to go back and fix a facet, I think. Yeah, I have a very hard time getting those lines to run straight and true without wavering all over the place. And that I think is about like depth of cut control. I think it's two things. One is is control of depth, which is true here. It's true in in in, in uh, color rosing, and I think another part is preparing your uh, the area you're working on so it'll already be as perfect as you can get it ahead of time if you have it all prepared and the size the, the two sides here are correct then uh, it shouldn't shouldn't be a problem mm. but practice i guess makes perfect yeah yeah i've been practicing on on these and on this one and another one and another one and another one <laughs> carving a few spoons there aren't <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, a lot of practice, I guess, really is the, the, the key here. I started doing, uh, I, I, I figured out it doesn't make sense that I put a template and I haven't tried it. So I'm, I'm trying all the different ones in the template. Yesterday evening, I, I, I started doing the owl. Nice. Next, I have to do the um, skull. Lauren, um how do you feel about these larger finials and the, like the balance of the spoon for using? Oh, that question. This is very uncomfortable. That was one thing I kept, except the fact that it doesn't slip inside your bowl because he's got a little hook at the back, but yeah. it's really strange. Yeah. So when you hold it, you kind of feel it. We, um, we give ergonomics a bit too much credit um, and yeah. not our credit for ourselves. Um, yeah. When I, I'm a product engineer or a product designer. Um, and uh, one of the things we learned in their ergonomics is that um, uh, the flexibility of, of something is very important. The fact that I can move my hand and I'm limited in a certain way of holding it is important. Um, so a handle sometimes that's over ergonomic could uh, be difficult for a lot of people because it's not exactly for each person and each person's a little bit different and we don't always want to hold things exactly in the same way um so i feel it's the same with with the spoons we really can grasp a spoon like this and we can grab a spoon like this and as i was saying before i i 
um, well, for and rise up that I hold my spoon lower down more like a more like a pen, like a pres pres precision grip, it's called. So I kind of hold it more down here. Um, so I, I don't think necessarily we have to uh, be fixed on how exactly the spoon is. Not exactly the answer about the balance, but it, it, it kind of relates to it that we have the flexibility as people to move around and counterbalance whatever is happening. So even a spoon that's a little bit top heavy or has something kind of in the way, it's not going to necessarily keep us from being able to use it. No, one more question. Do you ever use word holding? Do I use what? What was that? Work holding? Yeah. Like some like a like a something that'll hold my work down while I'm working? Is that what is it? Yeah, like like for example, when I was carving my spoon, I um I left my I, I started carving the finial before I had done very much of the rest of the blank. And I just held it down on my bench with a hold fast and used a chisel. Hmm. Um, you know, I've, I've never, I've never tried. That. Um, I should give it a try. I don't see why, see why not. I, it would probably be safer, I assume. Well, that was my feeling because I don't do this kind of intricate work. So I was like, well, how do I get my fingers out of here? Yeah, that that does make sense. I, but uh, I've never been very comfortable with with them because I kind of need my extra support. If, uh, I think most of us do this, but I feel I do this all, all, all the time. I use mostly this hand has the power for the carving, and this is the precision. So I'm holding here, but I'm pushing with these fingers. Uh, I do a lot of that. Um, I've got calluses all over my fingers here like a guitar player um, because I push so hard all the time under the back of my knife. And um, I feel that if it was held down, maybe I wouldn't have that, that support that I, that, I am so, that I count on so much by pushing back here. I also experienced that when you have a hole fast, you will limit uh, the, the thing you work on to a certain uh, angle. And when you hold it in your hand, you can flip it around and get to it from all sides. And it's, it's much faster for me, at least. When, when you're holding it. Exactly. So when, when you do your carving, um, you do it all in your hand or on, on your lap? Yeah, in my hand. I find the same when I do detail carving. I'm always moving it around and doing different things. So. It's starting to take shape. I try, like I said before, I do it in steps. I rough it out. I get everything relatively in the same steps. So this would be, this is what I would say is a blank. And then um, I, I move on to the next step. Follow it a little bit just so I can get the angle right. I'm using the Tuca cam right now, like a regular um, hook knife, just as a big hook knife. But this isn't the I usually use a Tuca cam. I have a tendency when I ask to, uh, I guess we, we have this problem, all of us, because we are usually, well, all of us, except uh, Dan, because most of us use one hand for your knives and we don't, and then <laughs> um, also when I'm axing, usually I get this side a little bit higher than this side, just because of the direction I'm holding the knife. So I leave enough room to correct that. I think even if without looking, I can always know that I need to take off a bit of material right here. Um, now this is true as well when we're cutting 
out our shape this direction because we're working this way on one side and we flip it over and work this way on the other. We do have slight angle favoring one of these two directions. And sometimes we look at it and we say it's, it's 90 degrees. I did it right, but um, something is a little bit off. It's not symmetric, but I am following the lines. I find that you, that's the reason. We are a little bit offset. We have a little bit of flaring out on one of the sides and then the other side, the other direction. So what it does is we have a little bit of a, a parallel spoon kind of runs this way. So we need to look at it from all directions. See, I did that as well. It kind of went this direction. So we need to double check ourselves and go back and make sure we don't have any flaring out because it kind of confuses our eyes. We see the back of the spoon a little bit or we have a parallax effect and that messes us up. Um, one option is taking a picture of your spoon while you're working every little while, um, take, flatten it out with a 2D picture. What that does is it doesn't allow our eyes to fix mistakes that we are seeing and it's easier to see mistakes. I'm sure we've all done this. So we've uh, taken a picture of our spoon. We are ready to upload it to Instagram. And then we say, oh, look at that. We see our mistakes only when we're ready to upload it. So if we take a, these a few steps back, take a picture of it, and then with that picture kind of figure out where we need to make our corrections along the way, you'll save yourself uh, that picture and uh, you, you could do that, that correct correction at an earlier state. I, I usually find myself about to upload and then I'm, I'm standing there next to the camera and next to the thing doing a little bit of touch-ups that I only saw in the picture just before uploading. So that's just, that's a free tip. You can also uh, look um, on your thing through a mirror. So you get this, um, so your, your sides are switched right. and so It'll you fly. get an idea for that. This is like the chest. Um, I call I call this this one the one when you put it up in your chest and pull towards you, um, the suicide grip. I don't know if you guys call it the same. Um, but this is the knee version of that. So, oh, that's a good idea. Pull, 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 and then it's a little bit slippery the knee, but mm. um, it it works for the, for for the, for the camera. One, two, and three. I usually if I need to correct them, I do the whole pattern again. The outside, middle ones, and then uh, this one. Uh, and sometimes if I'm showing it again and again, eventually it gets so flat that you can hardly see them. Uh, one of the tricks in facets to make them pronounced is is the the width here needs to be big the closer it is to a circle um the more you're going to see them because your angles are going to be uh sharper now if you're starting out with a thin handle um you're they're not going to be very pronounced because it's all going to be flat so the difference between the angles of the two facets is not going to be very big so if you start out with a funky thick handle you're going to get a lot better thicker um facets um the spot on the knife you're using will affect it a little bit as well so if you're using a your knife at the tip you'll be able to get you know a little bit of a better facet um i think we were talking about it yesterday about uh some of the knives that you made like with a big curve here that they might be better for for facets and i know that some people use uh, even hook knives uh, for their facets and they'll just run it right along 
like that. get a really extreme look at that that's a bit a bit much no but watching you do that made me want to applaud like when a guitarist does a really good guitar solo because you did that just for demonstration with a knife you're not used to using and it came out great i've never tried this actually but um um yeah it, it it works and it's pretty cool. I think I might try that um, for spoons that I'm painting. And if I want to have little, like really extreme highlights right there, um, is one one way to do it. Um, is there anything uh, specific uh, you'd like me to go over again or? I guess I can finish this, this snail meanwhile. Just real quick, what size is that U gouge that you're using? If it's oh, here it is. Um, I think this one is the one millimeter. Okay. Thank you. No problem. So again. Um, you need to remember the gr the grain direction. If you're not uh, used to working with with the gouge, um, all the same rules apply for the gouges as they do for anything else. The grain direction um, it it'll feel like you could just run freely, but it's very important to remember where you're putting pressure. This center area, if you put too much pressure in one point, it could fall out. So remember the direction you're working. And um, you could also get tear out easily or this whole area falling out. So it's the, the, the same as, uh, as when you're cart. Yeah, it's also easy with those small gouges to accidentally dip below one corner or the other, depending on the depth of your cut. And if you do that, you're definitely going to run into tear out and problems. You always want to keep your the, the depth of the cut below the, the wings, the, the points, the corners of the gouge. Yeah, that uh, depends on what kind of, how deep your, your gouge is. Exactly. Um, this one, pretty deep. So you could go in pretty far yeah. with this. Yeah. All right, can you, can you guys all appreciate the farm animal sounds I put on in the background? <laughs> Great. <laughs> Uh, the roosters were crowing while you were carving that chicken. It was a nice touch. Thank you. It's all synchronized. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you can't hear, but while I'm carving the snail, there's a snail walking along in the garden right now. <laughs> Anybody have any other questions for Arn? I just want to express, I think it's amazing that you're a few miles from Tel Aviv in a country that has 9 million people on a tiny footprint and you're on a farm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm in a really good location. I am very close to the city, uh, but, uh, but still in very rural area. It's really true, very far. Alon says, it, for Israeli standards, it's relatively far. 20 minutes is far. It's a very small country. Um, I've got a question. Do you put this spiral on the back of the snail shell as well as the front? Uh, snails uh, have a spiral only on one side, usually. Uh -huh. Some species of what of uh, marine snails that the spiral is um, you could see it the same symmetric on both sides but most land snails 
don't have the spiral on that side, I'll just get a snail. The one who is walking around. <laughs> so here's a snail. Oh, yeah. And when I flip it around. Oh, yeah. That's a very common mistake for people carving the snails. The way it kind of loops is from here outwards to here. So more like, and then you just twist it sideways. So on the side depends, species of snail I'm doing is not this one, it, it's more pronounced in the bottom and then it kind of loops on top of itself. Um, it's okay. more common uh, desert snail, I guess. Since you just went and picked up a snail shell, in general, when you're carving like small figures and stuff, do you try and carve with something that you have a real example of that you can carve to scale? Um, I, I, I look a lot at a lot of references. I do a lot of sketching. Um, okay. I usually have a sketchbook full of uh, uh, spoon ideas and things to go on spoons. And I'll sketch it from every direction that I can before. I attempt to spend all my time on figuring it out. Um, it's, I feel it's difficult to, to figure things out while carving a spoon because I'm removing material. If I was doing it with, with uh, Play-Doh, then uh, I could figure that out easily. But I think it's maybe it's just because that's what I do as my profession as well. I um, Usually my steps in designing a product is I sketch it out first and uh, think about all the different problems that I might encounter along the way. Uh, so that's that's my process of, of doing it. Um, so it's either physically like here with, with the snail. Um, uh, usually the reason I keep this shell in my toolbox is um, if I'm putting a snail in an area that I haven't done before and I want to kind of think about the direction it's going to go, I will kind of put it on, on, on here and figure it out a bit of the 3D ahead of time and think mm -hmm. about wh where it would be and what, what direction the spiral would go, which direction the snail itself would climb. So, so it, it helps kind of like um, you know, some people, the uh, artists that draw would, would hold a little cube and move it around and figure out uh, the shading Just remember when you're doing the eyes, as I mentioned earlier with the horns on the, there it is. See, I came up with the hook tool with the, with the U gouge uh, from the bottom and it didn't have any support. So he lost one of his eyes. Now a, a snail this short, I should have, I should have thought of that with the, this wood is, is very soft. Um, and it, not the wood I'm usually using, and it won't, wouldn't have been able to support those eyes hovering up in the air like that, like I wanted. I should have put them down. So that was very short grain on very soft wood. So I lost, uh, lost the, the eyes on, uh, on this one. Mm. My solution in, in, in something like that usually would be to make the whole, the whole snail smaller. Um, a snail could be very extended, very long, but if it's very short peeking out, um, it, I think it kind of takes away from the snail. So what I'm going to do is make this a much smaller shell and then make the snail coming out down this way. And uh, of course, if, if the shell completely is broken as well, then I uh, take off the shell and just make it a slug. A homeless snail. That's right.
Is that how we can tell from your previous uh, snail wounds what happened? Like if, if we see on Instagram uh, a, a snail without a shell? Yeah, if it's a snail without a shell, it's that's what happened. I think all the all the slugs I've ever done have been because I've accidentally broken the shell or hit it with the axe or something, and and then that's how it became a slug. <laughs> and slight tracks there. That's cool. Can you usually tell that it's the spoon? What was that? Um, I said, if if your whole finial doesn't really work out, can you still salvage salvage the spoon? Yeah, I, I could put a ball finial or just take it off. And 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 uh, um, I don't know what people do with the spoon that doesn't have a snail on it anymore. But I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it it really depends, I guess, if if the design of the of the uh still works um yeah. this is a very short spoon and it's it, it works just fine but i feel that in the balance of the of of the aesthetic of the spoon itself that extra something makes it a little bit nicer of a of the size ratio so it was kind of kind of designed in general for that but of course it'll be just fine without it yeah, I mean, without it, it's basically just a, a pocket spoon, you know. Yeah. It, what's it's fun also uh, playing with colors with these kinds of uh, different with these kinds of different uh, things that you add to it like uh, most colorful ones this would be an example I showed you before but just adding a dab of color uh, to, to the spoons so I've, I'm sure you've seen that I've been doing gold for the shells or could do with it um even uh, adding some color rosing and things like that well relief carving you can do as the whole handle i brought here my halloween spoon from this year um so it's all carved out as a relief um and it works fine as a as a spoon even though it's not the most comfortable but um this is an example of uh, mixing the handle into the to the spoon Oh, another one to do. This one I'm making as a as a feather spoon. I'll just finish this one quickly, and then uh, if nobody has any more questions, we can just carve in silence. Yeah, if, actually, if if nobody has any questions uh, at this point, I'll probably end up stopping the recording. I'm um, Owen. Yes. Uh, do you have one interesting snail fact that all the things you've learned about snails, do you have one interesting or funny fact that was surprising to you? Um, well, I've, I've been into snails for a long time, so it's hard to surprise me anymore, but not a lot of people know this unless they've been on Rise Up With Me lately because I've been talking a lot about snails, but most snails can mate with themselves. They are hermaphrodite in addition to the fact that they can also mate with themselves. So each snail is a male and a female. And if they don't find a partner or a match on Tinder, they can always just impregnate themselves. <laughs> yeah, that's a lucky uh, snail. How, how on earth do they do that? They have uh, both, uh, uh, both parts. So both and... organs. And then they can be, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, when they are mating, they mate from a little bit far away. And what they do is they send out what's called uh, um, love arrows. They're <laughs> like these. That's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> little arrows that they shoot out and they hit each other 
close to the neck, their reproductive area is right ne behind their right eye. Wow. Is it true as well that they, um, when they crawl back into their shell, they sleep right next to their anus? <laughs> uh, well, it's all one thing in there. It's all very close. So yeah, I guess so. Yeah, their anus is right here or close <laughs> to the shell. They have an opening yeah. right, like right there. And yeah, I guess they're snug up in there right next to it. <laughs> it's not... uh, well, it's kind of the way a dog sleeps when it curls up or a cat. <laughs> that's true. Or me, yeah. Depending on how tight a fetal position you can get into. <laughs> yeah, I'm very flexible. When a, when a snail mates with itself, is the offspring uh, like a genetic copy? I don't know. That's a good question. What? You don't know? Self-cloning. No. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I would assume. You're not very the health fan I thought you were on. <laughs> You're just a part-time snail fan, aren't you? That's right. I I do it just as a side hustle, the snails. <laughs> <laughs> not really serious about snails, are you? <laughs> All right. If there are no more questions, then thank you, Orin. I'm going to say yes. Thank you very much, Orin. This was this was excellent. Uh, obviously, people are free to stick around and continue carving. You know, if you have, if you think of other questions, obviously feel free to ask. Uh, but I'm going to uh, bring this particular rise up and carve recorded session to an end. And uh, again, thank you very much, Ryan. This was wonderful. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, everybody, for uh, participating. Thank you. Where can we find the video? Us.